Well, welcome everybody. It's about uh, seven o'clock here in Texas, uh, eight o'clock on the East Coast, and you guys are just getting done with work out, out in the West, I would imagine. So mm -hmm. thank you guys for joining us. We got quite a pr pretty good crowd on here tonight. We do. Uh, and we're going to be talking about, uh, you know, mostly referrals. You know, we put in here sleep physicians or certainly other doctors that we can get referrals from. But, you know, I think we all start there. Uh, wouldn't you say, Mark? I would. I think that I think that most people, when they're starting to get into sleep, a general dentist would, of course, look at their own patient population first, and then they'd get very excited about starting to develop some relationships with their local sleep docs. But as you're going to point out, there's room for a little bit more than that as well. Yeah, and we've both been doing this for a long time, uh, you know, 20 years probably. Uh, for me, I have a little bit less hair than Mark. I'm um, I, I like to say my hair's not gray, but that's because I don't have any hair. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, you know, I'm, I'm co-founder of Dental Sleep Solutions, along with Guy Yatros and DS3 uh, Software. Mark, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. So I'm the director of clinical education uh, and lead faculty for Prasamna Sleep Technologies. And so that's where I spend most of my time. Um, I'm fortunate in that, like you, I've had a long history in sleep. Mine, mine dates back to made my first sleep device teaching with Keith Thornton down at the Panky Institute, making a tap device. It was a horrible looking thing. It looked like an upper impression tray with a handle sticking down and the lower one was flat and you'd, you'd hit that till you advanced far enough to drop down. <clears throat> uh, no titration, no pre and post sleep test. Um, what we did was probably horrible, but we probably got a few people to quit snoring and maybe help some sleep apnea. And, but we were, we were some of those, uh, he was a pioneer and I was following him, I guess, a little bit. Um, the other thing I do is I teach at the University of Detroit. So like you with U of T, <clears throat> I do a little bit of lecturing there on occlusion and sleep. Uh, we're hoping to start a sleep program this coming year. That'd be kind of exciting. And then I get to practice one day a week here in beautiful Rochester Hills, Michigan. So what's not to like about that? That's me in a nutshell. Awesome. Well, there there are a couple of conflicts of interest as we talk about that, you know, DS3 and, and uh, Dental Sleep Solutions and certainly Prosomnus. So keep that in mind as we go through this. So grain of salt. Everybody keep a grain of salt on their tongue when we're talking. Exactly. So but but we do a pretty good job of uh, Mark and I both of telling telling you how it is, really. Uh, I, I would agree, Mark, when you talk about the first taps we made, you know, they, they literally were impression trays, you know, that we just oh hooked them God, together horrible. and that kind of thing. So, but, but we want to talk about, you know, some of you have been in this for a while. Some of you are just getting started and people are always asking, you know, where do I get more patients? How do we get more patients and how do I work with sleep docs and stuff like that? And I think, I think that's the point, isn't it, Mark, mm -hmm. that we want to get more patients. I mean, we, some of us exhaust that our own patient population shortly and, and, you know, where does, where does this next one come from? Yeah, I think that's the, that's really the trick is um, what I've seen as a pattern in most dentists is a general practitioner will say, you know, I want to add sleep to my armamentarium and, and to my treatment protocols. And so, it's, it's maybe they got, maybe emotionally they got attracted to sleep or maybe they were treated for sleep themselves or maybe they took a class somewhere. Maybe they branched off from TND. There's so many different ways they get interested in sleep. And the first thing to do is look at their own patient population, screen them and start treating them. But they, they, they know that even though there might be two or three or 400 patients in need of treatment in their practice, they're going to run out of folks. And so that's, that's a problem. For me, it was an interesting problem. When I started back up here in Rochester, I didn't have a practice to to go around and, and mine my own patients. So I went out and met with general dentists in the area who didn't want to do sleep. And that was my first volley into that. And then I began to develop the relationships with, with a couple or three local sleep physicians. And that's been good for me and a couple of primary cares. So that's been good. But the point is, yeah, more patients because we've got an, an, an epidemic that's been you know under our nose all the time, this uh, sleep apnea. And there's just so many people that need treatment. And we've maybe only treated 10, 15 I know it's not 20% of the population that has sleep apnea has been treated. So there's a huge population out there and, and it's incredibly meaningful to, to treat those folks for that and really fulfilling for the team and the staff. And Oh, by the way, you get paid pretty well. So it's not a bad deal. Yeah, certainly not. So uh, Lynn Liptak had his hand up for something. Oh. Should we? Uh, He's probably no, just waving to us. eh? I don't know. So you put this slide in here, Mark. Why did you put that slide in here? I did. So, you know, and, and you've heard me say this. So thank you for the softball toss on that. So it's time for you to take a sip of coffee. You know, I'm a big advocate of looking at what's happening out there in dental sleep medicine. And, and I believe that 
there are some things that we can do very meaningfully and intentionally that will help change the way physicians in general and there's certainly exceptions you know Lee Serkin's on this on this webinar I work with Eddie Saul a lot you know at Prosomnus he's our, our medical director so there's some great physicians out there who really get it and understand the role of oral appliance therapy but there's still a large number of them that they see a patient and they have obstructive sleep apnea and they go right to pap therapy and so if that's the protocol that's being done you know one way of looking at it is to say that there's about four and a half billion that's with a b billion dollars worth of, of CPAP or various PAP therapies written as prescriptions on an annual basis in the United States and a little less than 200 million in oral appliance therapy. Now, when you look at that and think for just a second, a simple 10% shift, and that's about 5%, by the way, five to 6% of total market, a 10% shift in the prescribing patterns of physicians would create $450 million more of oral appliance therapy overnight. That's almost tripling the, the marketplace of what we see for oral appliance therapy by just changing a 10%, not 50, not 75. We're not asking for half the, device, half the patients to be treated with oral appliances like they are in some uh, Scandinavian countries. Just to say that if the if all of the sleep physicians followed the AASM and AADSM joint guidelines from 2015 that talked about mild and moderate treatment, that the patient could have a choice for appliance therapy. Ah, why don't they? Well, there's a lot of good reasons they don't. They don't necessarily have the trust in us or there aren't enough qualified dentists. They don't know where to find them. You know, we're going to go over some of that tonight. So there's, there's some, there were dentists like me who were playing cowboy with Keith Thornton back in the day, treating people without even a physician being involved and pretending to treat them for snoring. That was horrible. You know, we created tremendous mistrust in, in the profession. And so, but there's this huge opportunity for us to help more people. And, and even if we just treated the CPAP failures, we'd be busier than we could imagine being. So there's just, this is just a, a slide that just says there's a huge opportunity out there. Yeah, unfortunately, there weren't too many of you cowboys out there doing that, creating that mistrust. You know, if, if there had been 100,000 dentists that had jumped on that train, uh, we, we'd be in trouble. I, I think the flip side of this too, Mark, is it's interesting is, interesting is if you and I had been sitting there uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s, when John Remmers was going, hey, I think this guy has sleep apnea. And we said, Hey, let's grab a hold of his tongue and pull it forward, you know, a little bit. I, I think we might ha very well have more of the uh, market share, uh, certainly than we do today, but I think CPAP would be struggling a little bit. And when you look at this, you know, there aren't really a lot of great treatment options out there. You know, people, no. you know, when I go to bed, you know, I mean, what do you, I'm supposed to put on my my splints for my carpal tunnel and I'm supposed to put my boots on for my plantar fasciitis and my wife's elbowing me going, Hey, don't forget your dental thing. You know, that's what she calls it. You're, you're snoring already, you know? So, but say that again, one more time for me, cause I want that to sink in for everybody, a 10% change, a 10% shift in the prescribing patterns of physicians on PAP therapy, $4.5 billion, 10% would be 450 million. A 10% shift would almost triple the oral appliance market overnight. And don't, and don't mishear me at all. There's nothing wrong with PAP therapy. I mean, it's, it's cumbersome, sure. It's not easy for people to wear. The adherence is not great. But, you know, we need that because I have, you know, I, the best I've ever done is 50-50 in terms of being able to treat severes with an oral appliance. And that's not getting many of them down below five. That's getting them below 10. And so treating severes is really tough, but mild to moderates, we have reasonably good success with. So I think on the mild moderate side, there's this aspect of choice we could consider. And it isn't until you get to the severes where you say, well, I, I really think we've got we've to try PAP therapy first. So I think in the, in the mild moderates, there's a lot more choice. Yeah. So DS3, this is my conflict of interest. You know, we, uh, Guy and I have been doing it for a long time. You know, you can type consultation in the question box. We prefer that you guys use the question box instead of the chat. And uh, that's what we do is Guy and I started that company just to help dentists do more sleep and to do better sleep. We probably uh, give away more education than everybody else combined. And, you know, we're, we're pretty good at what we're doing. You don't have to reinvent the wheel here. So, you know, when, uh, and I think about uh, 
how we get things done, whether that's in our families or our church group or our workplace or whatever, you know, it, it's through relationships for the most part. And the, uh, the, I, I want to somehow reach out there and grab a hold of these dentists and shake them a little bit and tell them that they, if they've been through any type of sleep course, they probably know more than most of the primary care physicians do about sleep, you know, just after sitting through a three hours dental sleep medicine course. So there, there's a lot of misinformation out there amongst the dentists as well as the physicians. So, and as Mark and I were talking about <clears throat> this particular question, you know, how do we win the hearts of these sleep physicians? These are the three things that we kind of came up with, you know, between relationships, we have to build that trust. I know, Mark, you mentioned earlier that uh, I think I, I may have created some mistrust in the beginning, you know, doing some of the things that we were doing because we didn't really Don't know you. what we were doing. And there's a whole lot more science out there now than there used to be. You know, when I made my first dental device, we didn't have an insurance code we could use. We, we didn't, uh, there, there wasn't anything about a prescription or, you know, a follow-up sleep test or any of that kind of stuff. So we've come a long way. So here are our learning objectives tonight. And this is certainly uh, something that we want you to take away from this. So we're going to cover all of this. You want to talk about any of those in particular, Mark, or just kind of as we go through it? No, I, I think that's fine. We're going to we're going to talk about how you, you know, th there's always the barrier of trying to get just like a salesperson is always trying to get in front of us. And we've got a gatekeeper that protects us all the time if they're doing a good job. And so, you know, being able to schedule a meeting, what are the kind of things that physicians want to know about? What kind of documentation? And then there's some things that we that we probably don't want to say or think like I, I would not want to have a poster um, I've seen some posters that are, you know, very anti CPAP. I wouldn't want to have an anti CPAP poster because I'm going to have to recommend that therapy to some patients. And so I want to be a little bit careful of what I'm recommending, what I'm not recommending. So I want to make sure that, you know, we, we're supporting and, and not supporting the right kind of things. So why don't you take us through some of the, you know, how do we get, get, get around sitting down and, and having those kind of uh, appointments with physicians and getting in, in their space a little bit? Thank you for that tee up. But you're absolutely right. When I, I think uh, before the pandemic, Mark, I was doing three or four lunch and learns every single week, at least 50 weeks out of the year. So I, I, I don't know how many other lunch and learns dentists do, but I think that's probably as many as half the dentists in the country have been doing. Yeah. So I get, to, I get to ask a lot of questions to these physicians. And, and one of them I, I simply ask is, you know, what would it take to make this happen? You know, and they, they say, man, I just want it easy. I want it easy. You know, um, mm -hmm. I, I want to make the referral. I want to know it's, it's done. You know, I, I want somebody helping me manage this disease. Uh, I know you've got a couple of slides in here later where we talk about communication and, and what some of these physicians do. You've got a little bit uh, more of a scientific study on this. This is just me. You know, when I go out there sure. and I talk to these guys, what do they do? And, you know, when we talk about affordable, I don't think most dentists understand that uh, if a physician makes a referral to me and I want to charge $5,000 for a dental device and I don't take insurance that I actually made him look bad because, Absolutely. you know, when we think about what six people out of 10 in the United States can write us a check for $500 today. So when we think about that, uh, I, I think we have to be sensitive to that. I'm not telling you that you have to go and network. I'm not telling you that you have to do any of that, but you certainly have to have a way that you can make it affordable for your patients. So, you know, I, I think if you were the physician about to make a referral, I mean, think about if you're a dentist and you're going to make a referral to a periodontist and you make 10 referrals this month, the guy never calls you, never thanks you, never write you a letter, you know, how, how long does that go on? Yet that's what we are guilty of as dentists a lot of times when we do get these referrals. So Richard, I well, think that's such a great analogy thinking about us and the referral and thinking about the specialist kind of relationship we have now. That's a great analogy. I love that. Thanks for bringing that up. 
what what else in that particular thing? You want to wait till your slide comes up, and we can talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll pipe in as it's appropriate, and we'll you know bounce back and forth. But I think I think where you're going is really important. Is that we, you know we've got a we've got a we've got to think about how it is on both sides of the fence and put ourselves walk a mile in everybody else's shoes and think what's right for them. And, and I think that's, that's, that's where we're going as a profession the last several years, fortunately. So I think the relationships are getting better and the trust is getting better and the science is getting better. So I think that's, that's all very good stuff for sure. We're definitely heading in the right direction. You know, to think back to when we were first starting this, you know, we really didn't know what we were doing, a lot of us. And, and now you certainly don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are a lot of educational opportunities out there. Um, there are some uh, companies that can help you bill for this as well. There, there are other companies like DS3 that do software. There are devices that are being made are, are better and smaller, and there's more science behind a lot of this stuff. So, but when we sit down, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to talk to a, a sleep physician. Somehow I've got to get in front of that person. Now, is, is the physician the person that I really have to get in front of? Well, maybe, but maybe not too. I have seen practices where there's a very strong, very aggressive referral coordinator, and she pretty much tells that practitioner where he should refer patients. You can change the pronouns around all you want. There's no he or she here, but there, you know, sometimes a referral coordinator is really the person you want to talk to more than you do the physician, especially when you have larger physician groups, you know, so when we want to get into a, an office where we can sit down and talk with the providers, mm -hmm. we typically would send them a, a digital copy of our brochure or something like that and then we follow up the next day with a call and and, and our, what does our digital uh practice say you know i've got two locations i'm in that happen to be in network with a lot of medical insurers board certified we do free consultations you know i just want oh i, I heard a uh, sportscaster the other night mark talk about how the really good sportscasters speak in eight second sound bites because you know that's what we want to hear so if we think about we're going to have just a little bit of time in front of these people you know mm -hmm. we we want to we want to do that so we might send them a copy of our prescription letter of medical necessity you know what we need but we're also starting that relationship right then and there when we call somebody on the phone mm -hmm. you know one of the things that's worked well for me for trying to, to get that opportunity to get in front of them and you're right about having the limited time they're busy uh, they're they're scrambling. It's a lot harder for them, I think, than what we do in dentistry. Is um, I've dropped off, or Kimberly has dropped off, um, the registry that we use, which shows like my last fifty cases, our success rates. It's got I've got one card stapled to the top of it, and then we we come in there, and and our request is not for them to take information from us and give us referrals, but I want some of their cards. Mm -hmm. And I want to know what kind of information they need when I make a referral to them. What do you want to have? And it's interesting because then they, they kind of stop like, you're not coming in asking for something, you know, to give to us. No, I want to know. I'd like to make some referrals. We both live in the same neighborhood. We both practice in the same area. We're going to see some of the same patients. And invariably, we've got some patients that they've that we've already shared accidentally. You know, mm -hmm. that a patient of mine or that was referred in from a, a dentist who has already seen and failed CPAP or something. So then we have some, I'll say some of your patients are in there. So now I make some referrals to them and now it's easier to come back and knock on the door and say, hey, we have a few more mutual patients. And and the other part of that is, and you taught me this so well uh, a few years ago, uh, the one word that you left me with was be persistent, be persistent, and then be persistent. <laughs> And you are right. Uh, yeah, but I like what you said there about re reciprocating that because yeah. I, I think that's a great way to get your foot in the door. And again, think about I make a referral to a periodontist. If I make 10 of those referrals and I never get one back, these things can't ever be too lopsided. You know? Amen. Yeah. Amen. And, and primary care physicians are a little bit used to that because they're always referring people out for that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. But, uh, you know, you certainly want to mention that and talk about that when you're, when you're there. And I love the, I love the, uh, the little card. I had never thought of that, you know, with the last uh, few cases, that's a great idea. Yeah. 
fun. I'd have to keep track of that stuff then, wouldn't I? <laughs> we talk about expectations because, you know, when we, when we actually set up a lunch and learn uh, for that type of thing, typically we say, the, the person we're talking to says, well, you know, Dr. Murphy, he, he only eats uh, steaks from Ruth's Chris and uh, Dr. Drake, he's a vegetarian. He wants a salad from uh, McAllister's down the street. And we go, no, 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 no. We don't do any of that stuff. You know, uh, depending on the size of the group, you know, we don't ever spend more than a hundred dollars on lunch. We typically take uh, trays of uh, chicken salad sandwiches, a big couple of big salads and a big vegetable tray with some spinach dip and, you know, iced tea and lemonade or something like that. We, we take something that pretty much anybody could eat, you know, whether you're, you're a vegetarian or not, or, you know, you're, you're gluten-free or whatever. So th those are some guidelines on the, on the types of things. If you're going to go talk to a sleep physician and he goes, hey, man, I'd, I'd really love to have a, a Philly cheesesteak from uh, Jimmy John's down the street. Can you stop by and get me one? Absolutely, we can. You know, that's different from an office that has 12 providers and four, a staff of 40 people. That's, com that's completely different. So you got to, you know, use your brain. These are just guidelines, you know, when you think about this. And I put in there too, Mark, that time is money because I have a staff member go get the food, you know, and do that. And this is assuming we've already set all of this meeting up. And, but what time do we want Dr. Murphy to be there? What time will the doctor be available, the provider? You know, we usually say providers mm -hmm. now because I, I will tell you, Mark, in the last year, I'm going to say it's up getting close to 20% now of my referrals are coming from PAs and nurse practitioners. Yep. Seeing more and more of that. Absolutely. More and more and more and more of that. So we, we talk about providers. So, but, but those are just some guidelines for, you know, this type of thing. You can do breakfast and lunch just as well. You can, you can get bagels or breakfast tacos in South Texas is what everybody does out here and coffee and things like that. Uh, but, you know, those practices are busy. Your time is important as well. So we, we, we certainly don't want to go and show up and wait for 45 minutes or an hour and the provider never shows up. For sure. For sure. So we want to set those expectations up front, you know, when we do that. So, you know, if we're going to provide lunch for your entire office, then we want to see half of the providers for at least five to 10 minutes or something like that. And most of the people are like, yeah, okay. You know, most people will say that because that, that girl wants to get lunch anyway. And uh, whether or not, you know, and then we have to be persistent and a little bit aggressive sometimes when we, when we get there. You know, I, I have uh, a marketing person who will c go get the food. They'll set up the meeting. They confirm it. Uh, we have the address. We have it mapped out through Google Maps. I know exactly where I need to go. I know what floor it is. I know I don't spend waste any time trying to look for this place. And I go right up there at the right time. And if there and I usually text her and I say I'm five minutes away and she'll go start looking for the providers. You know, she'll go, start walking through the office and saying th right. that. So what's different today? <laughs> you know, we're not doing as many lunch and learns. So we started to offer the Zoom meetings, you know, to do this. And we're getting more and more people to take us up on this. So Great. we typically don't provide lunch when we're going to do a Zoom meeting. If the doctor wants a sandwich while she sits down and talks to me, then I'll order one and have it delivered. That's okay. I don't mind doing that. But I don't particularly want to buy lunch when this is what we're doing. And I, I can't tell you, Mark, I've done in the last two weeks, I think I've done three or four of these on the phone. So they weren't even Zoom meetings. It was just, yeah. you know, here, hey, the doctor said, call her at this number. You know, she's sitting in her office eating a sandwich or something like that. So we can do it. But if you're going to do a Zoom meeting, make sure that they know how this works. You know, most of the younger docs get it because they do this. Uh, if they're a little bit older, they might never have gotten on to a Zoom meeting or something like that. It's a little bit hard to imagine uh, that today after doing this for several months now. But again, uh, cover your bases and be prepared when you do that. So, Absolutely. Uh, you know, make sure that the food's ordered, the meeting's confirmed, you know, what time you want to be there. We went through this already. Uh, I think 
you, you, I'm not making those initial calls, Mark. You're not. You just said Kim drops off my uh, yep. brochure and she drops off this. And hey, we want your uh, referrals. If we were to refer a patient to you, how do we get that? So that usually, uh, I, I would say, Mark, even I've seen their complete countenance change when you ask for their referrals. I mean, they it's like to, oh, mm -hmm. you know, you know, they're just more welcoming. So and we can talk about PowerPoints. We're going to do uh, a little, I'm going to show you a little bit of the PowerPoint that I put together. Uh, we don't always do that. Sometimes we do. Sometimes the lunch and learns are a very formal thing for a particular set of providers. In other words, they don't schedule them unless somebody's going to come in and their entire staff is actually going to learn about a drug or a procedure or something else, you know, that they could do. And some of them are very formal and everybody comes in at the same time and they all sit down and we have a, a PowerPoint yep. and we show it. They're not all like that, though. Sometimes not we sit all. down and we just talk. So you have to be a little bit flexible on that. But one of the things we want to offer you guys today is uh, we will send you the PowerPoint that I used for that if you just type type in PowerPoint into the questions, okay? Uh, so I think the takeaway from this slide, Mark, more than anything is make sure that you're prepared but before you get there. You know, sure. you've, you've had this, we're gonna talk a little bit about, uh, you know, you're much, much more into the science of this <laughs> type of thing and, and that's all great. I mean, that's part of your job and what you do. And I don't know exactly how many of the docs out there appreciate that part, but it, it's a high percentage of them. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they don't all respond to the same thing. And I right. think what makes you good at what you do is you pick up on who that particular provider is and what they want to talk about. And they may only want to talk about playing golf and you played a golf course that they played recently. And that's how you, you again, that's the relationship part of this. So you, you have to be somewhat flexible when you get in front of these people and, and, but at the same time, be relaxed and you're doing that. So make sure that somebody in your staff is managing the before uh, with all of this, because it makes it go so much more smoothly. I think the, the point you're making about flexibility is incredibly important because I've gone into some of these where I was told I'll have five, maybe 10 minutes with the doctor and we were there for 45 minutes or an mm -hmm. hour. Um, I'll have somewhere the initial conversation is about, you know, do you participate? Do you do a free consultation? Do you take Medicare? And they're just kind of checking the box and checking the list. And then something pops up in conversation and they ask a question that leads to the science. And so, uh, although I do have, like you suggested, a short PowerPoint, also sitting next to it open on the bottom, I always have a more robust PowerPoint so that if they say, by the way, so what do you mean by, you know, they're not all the same in terms of how they keep clean and stuff like that or side effects. I say, well, let me show you. And then I open up something that shows us some science and they're like, that's a little different. That's a little fresh. And so that that's fun to be able to adapt to what they're asking for so that I can jump wherever direction they want to go to. Uh, and and that's kind of fun. And they're not they're not expecting that usually. I think they're expecting some sort of canned presentation. So when you said be ready, be flexible, be yourself, I think that's one hundred percent correct. One hundred percent. Yeah, and we're going to share some of the uh, in the PowerPoint some of the slides that Mark yes. is, we're going to go through tonight as well too. So you guys will have those included in what we do, and I'm going to add those into my PowerPoint as well, Mark. It's okay if I steal those from you. Oh, you know, I've stolen so many from you that it, it's only paying you back. You're not really okay. stealing them from me; just paying awesome. you back. So let, let's talk about a couple of different types of docs if we're going to do so if, if we're if we're approaching a primary care physician, for example, and you got to remember, we keep very good track of this. Uh, we're right now in 2020. Mark, 43 percent of my referrals have come from primary care physicians. Wow. This year. Wow. I, I, I'm probably. So, you know, you and I've talked, I probably have 40% of my practice comes from physicians, PAs, you know, nurse practitioners. So I get 40% of that and about 60% from uh, dentists in the area because, uh, you know, so I don't have a patient population. And I would say of the 40% that are sleep, uh, that come from physicians, maybe 5% of those, 4% of those are primary care. And again, part of... 
in a different well, way. Well, part, part of that too, you know, like you said, be persistent, you know, when you do this. And that's certainly one of the takeaways from this. But the other thing is too, you know, you got to remember, this is a, this is a numbers game. You know, and if I get out there and I'm seeing two or three primary care physicians every week, because I've gone through the 27 sleep physicians in San Antonio. <laughs> three 40, times, three 40, times you've gone through 40 them. times already, you know, I've gone through there. <laughs> I, I saw one again the other day and he's, he said, man, Rich, because the, uh, my marketing person was there and they, this was, you know, they didn't, she didn't realize our relationship went back 20 years. And he, he looked at me and he said, man, we were a lot younger the first time we met, weren't we? And I said, yeah, but so, you know, don't just limit it to sleep physicians, but when you think about, you're going to get in front of a primary care physician. Cause I walked in the other day and I said, you know, how many patients of yours do you think have sleep apnea? And he said a bunch he used a four letter word there that I won't hear, but he said a bunch. And I thought, hmm, most dentists would probably keep talking about what they had planned to talk about at that point. And I didn't say anything. I just sat there. And it's amazing how uncomfortable most people are with any type of silence. Not that I'm accusing you of that, Dr. Murphy, but, you know, I'm going to say 10 seconds went by and he goes, well, you know, you're going to tell me what I should do about it. As a matter of fact, I am, you know, so again, talk, you know, ask questions. I think I've learned Mark after doing, uh, I don't know if I've done a thousand lunch and learns, but it's got to be getting close now. Yeah, I'm serious. I mean, I have done a bunch. And, and if I've learned anything, it's ask questions. Ask, asking questions is so much less uh, aggressive, so much less mm -hmm. intimidating. I'm not sure what the right word is there. But yeah, you know, I mean, patients have sleep apnea, you know, let them talk a little bit. Well, what do you what do you do for these people? You know, I, you know, what do people complain about when they come in your office? Oh, everybody has the same thing. I'm sleepy and tired all the time. You know, I'm tired. I don't have any energy. What do you do? Well, we check testosterone, thyroid, you know, uh, vitamin D. You know, we, we test a few of these things and anything else. Do you, do you ever do sleep tests? You know, I, I kind of walk them down that path. But you, sure. you know, you, I, I think, you, you know, up until the pandemic where we didn't have the option of doing telemedicine consults and we didn't have the option of doing all that. I never asked, would you be interested in me taking a little bit of this off your plate, but we can actually do a little bit of that now. You know, I, sure. I have a rheumatologist who refers me patients and he says, okay, Mark, you got your uh, rheumatoid arthritis. You lose the right to complain about your pain until you go see Drake and he, he deals with your sleep stuff. That's great. So, you know, he doesn't even send them to the sleep physician anymore because he knows they're going to get CPAP every single time. And, and it takes a couple of months to get a sleep test. So anyway, be flexible. You know, when these people want to talk, l just listen to them. And, and a little bit, you know, I'm OK if it goes off tangent a little bit, you know, but part of what you're so good at, Mark, is exactly that because you're so flexible and you're so confident in yourself and what you do that you make people feel comfortable. I think that's hard for a lot of dentists out there. And all I, I would say is, you know, be yourself and, and just relax when you go in there, mm -hmm. have maybe 10 or 15 questions that you can ask so that you get to listen a little bit and then you can do. So help me out with that. Anything else? Yeah, I think that, you know, we've got two ears and one mouth for a reason. There's a reason there's a ratio there. So I think the challenge is, um, I, I always think I'm a lot more interesting to listen to than the other person in those kind of situations. And so it's, sometimes I find it's real. That's what I'm thinking in my mind, you know. And so so it's really important for me to shut the hell up and let them talk. And I, I loved your your example of letting that silence, that that quiet, and, um, and asking a follow-up question, or, or sometimes it'll be a gesture like, so I'll say, so what do you think about that? And, and, huh? this is, you, go, and you kind of do this with your eyes, like, like it's their turn. To, you're making it clear to them. It's your turn to talk. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's a hard skill set to get comfortable with. I find myself, you know, like I'm doing right now, I want to just keep talking. And instead it's like, you know, you, you got somebody in front of you that 
you want to work with them, then you need to be as flexible as you can. And you need to morph your style and your communication and your listening skills to that. Because otherwise, you're just going to barrel through and you'll be lucky if you find one out of four or one out of five people that want to work with you. But if you can flex your style a little bit more, you might find two or two out of four or three out of four. You're still not going to find everybody, but you'll find more. Great point. And like you said way back in the beginning where if we just change 10% of the prescribing patterns, you know, we're going to triple the number of dental devices out there. Well, that's how we do this, you guys. We do it one doctor at a time. That's what yeah. I've been teaching for a decade now. It's just one doctor at a time. Every time I walk into a, den a, a, a physician provider office and I hear that person say, wow, I had no idea that you could do all of this as a dentist. And I, I look at my marketing person and I say, well, there's only 4,350 more doctors to go in San Antonio. Yeah. And, and when you think about it, that's how we do it one at a time. So let's switch gears now. Let's sure. say we're, in, we're, we're moving from an internist, to primary care, rheumatologist, cardiologist, doesn't matter, to a sleep doc. So now we certainly have somebody who knows more about this than we do probably, but uh, just throwing around a few terms, well, you know, hey, AHI, LSAT, you know, uh, O2, Nadir, we can throw around a few terms that certainly make it sound like we know what we're talking about. And I love the saying, uh, fake it till you make it, but, uh, you know, be confident. So we're, we're going to change that a little bit now to, you know, would you consider, um, you know, how do you decide who gets a CPAP and who gets a dental device? Well, I don't even prescribe dental devices. How come? You know, I, I mean, it just that that's not too intimidating, mm -hmm. you know, so depending on how they respond to these questions, then you're going to do that. And like you said, Mark, let them, you know, let them talk a little bit, because a lot yeah. of times if if we and I know you are so good at this, you 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 know, I really try to emulate you and in, in how good you are <laughs> at walking somebody down the path of saying exactly what you want them to say. Thank you. There is a real skill in that. But. But I've learned and I've watched you do that a couple of times and I have learned a few things because you, you have to have that flexibility, but you also have to, have to you have to be thinking uh, on your feet and you have to be just yeah. a little bit ahead of this conversation. You have to think, you know, well, what, what would you consider offering a dental device? Could I show you a couple of slides real quick on my laptop here? Because you didn't have that. You, you weren't prepared to do that, but mm -hmm. I always have my laptop with me. And he goes, oh, yeah, you think there's science out there that says these things work? Well, as a matter of fact, there is. Can I show you a few studies? You know, that that's completely different, but you have to have such a such a latitude of flexibility in how you do this. You know, I think when when I hear you say that, I, I think of my favorite kind of questions that I've um, kind of worked with when I'm sitting with a, um, a, a sleep physician in their office is I'll say, so um, can you, so so I say, you know, you know, I'm a dentist and, and you know that I'm not prescribing um, PAP therapy at all. I know a little bit about it. Um, and, and I always try to position myself as, you know, I see myself as a, a DME. I said, you know, you're in charge, you know, you drive the ship. And at the end of the day, it, you know, you're going to have patients who are going to get PAP therapy and oral appliance therapy. And some that fail PAP therapy end up back in oral appliance therapy and vice versa. And then I say like, so you know, I want them to know that they drive the ship and I'm the DME provider. I want them to know that in a sense, they're the ones responsible for treating the patient. Now think about that. I mean, that's kind of an important consideration for us in the relationship. They're responsible for thinking through and, and, and treating the patient and the obstructive sleep apnea. We are fulfilling a prescription. We're filling a prescription that they give us for that therapy. And so I say to them, so what's, what's your experience been with oral appliance therapy? Mm -hmm. And I wait and That's they say, question. oh, it's been pretty bad. You know, what's your experience been? And, and be ready because they could go east, they could go west, they could go north and south, they could pop around. And they'd say, well, blah, 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 and this and that. And I have a mixed review and I, and, and don't, don't defend when they say it's been bad and this and that, that is their experience. Honor that. And so I'd love to say, no, I, I hear that. I, in fact, I hear that all the time. And, and that's one of the things we're trying to change in this world. So I get that totally. And now I want their curiosity to pick up and say, well, what are you trying to change? Or how are you trying to change that? I'm trying to draw them into my conversation because if they have a perception that oral appliance therapy is all over the map, which could be true, 
or that they're in, seeing in their community. It could be in their be. community. Thank you. Yes. Or they're seeing appliances that come back that look kind of gunky, or there's or they got patients come back that you know have temporal mandibular joint pain or irritation, or they've had problems with the device or it broke. You know, if you start saying mine's better, this and that, and on stage, you say, tell me about your experience. Now you take in their experience and you say, I get that. I get that. And whether their experience is good or bad, or whatever, and you say, well, you know, that's that's interesting. I've heard a lot of that. And that's one of the things we're trying to change. And hopefully you get this curiosity up, like, what are you trying to change? Well, you know, I try to use different kinds of devices that have a better efficacy than that or have a have less proportion to turn out to be so gunky after a period of time or a little bit kinder on some of the side effects. And we've had really good results with that. Well, what kind of those? Keep their curiosity coming. Just like you'd walk a patient. Exactly. Walk, walk a patient down the pathway to wanting what here, think about this. I want the patient to want what I know they need. I know they need a bridge, mm -hmm. they need an implant here, they know this. So if I tell them, they're going to say to me, does my insurance cover that? And then we're in this battle. I'm trying to science them to death. But if I can get them to want to know what's possible for their mouth, if I could get a physician to say, well, what's different? I say, you know, the good news is with some of the modern materials and things we're working with, we get some really different results. Well, tell me about that. Well, here, and I, and I show them a model or bring something out and then, and there's a lot of science behind it and stuff like that. And maybe they say, what's the science? So, you know, you got to be ready for all these questions that might take you this way and this way and this way and just be prepared to say, well, I've got a couple articles. That I'm not sure if you want to look at them. Yeah, okay, great. And then out you come with that. And so that's, but you're absolutely right. It's about listening, letting them talk and asking the right kind of questions and guiding the conversation. I love that thinking. Yeah, and, and be flexible too, you know, because when, when I ask that type of question, somebody says, well, you know, they just haven't had good success with them. Well, well tell me about it. What are you measuring that by? Oh, well, we, you know, they, with well, a dentist just said, hey, you know, do a sleep test. Well, what position did you test them at? Well, I don't even know. I don't even know what the dentist knew, you know, and then I explain how titrating a dental device is just like titrating CPAP. Sure. And I say, hey, if, if you had to choose one CPAP pressure, and if you go over, you lose, <laughs> what CPAP pressure would you pick? Well, that's ridiculous. We can't do that. Well, how do you expect me to do that with a dental device? Amen. You know, so again, that's how we're changing the system. So the PowerPoint, we're just going to run through some of this. You want it to be easy, you know, the referral process. It goes both ways. You know, how do we do a diagnosed patient versus a non-diagnosed? Again, make sure that they know this is going to be as easy for them as you as it can be, that you will be sensitive to finances and that you will communicate that, you know, so show them some pictures, you know, this is the beginning of my PowerPoint. I'm in network with most ma ma major medical sleep is all we do all day, every day. We communicate with your patients. We have a couple of offices, you know, here's our patient protocols, you know, where they get a baseline sleep test. If they failed CPAP, then we put them in an MRD, mandibular repositioning device. We see them every three or four weeks, we're going to, we may have to be sensitive about if it's a sleep doc, he may not want me to use a pulse oximeter to help me titrate the device, the, the device. He wants to do the final sleep test. Well, I always make sure that they understand that. So, but we're communicating along that. And then we want to talk a little bit about dental devices. You should have a couple in your pocket when you walk in there. Absolutely. Because a lot of these physicians have never seen one. Or they may have seen this big old gaudy, god awful thing from ten years ago or whatever, and you you think, wow, you know, Richard, I, some of them are still out there, and you know it. <laughs> oh, I, I know. I, I'm trying to be nice there. So, Appreciate you it. know, when you when you look at this, so, um, and and then we get into, you know, the these are this is some of the latitude we want you guys to have with this. So, Mark's going to talk a little bit now about uh, the the science you know so we've we've yeah. gone from you know we're, we're moving from relationships and building this trust and into sinus science or right, right into their sinus like i'm doing a bad extraction i lose a bicuspid up there that's happened so yeah i i, I think the point that i would say is well, um, i talk through my nose all the time is is the 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 physician is likely to engage in a conversation about their experience with oral appliance therapy and if we think back to how a lot of the legacy devices have been designed and made and, and, and there isn't much you can do because if you've got to use cold cure acrylic, even if you try to put it under some pressure and stuff, there's still going to be larger, bulkier devices. I was, I was actually on the phone with a, a new doctor with Personas today. I do a lot of those. I do a lot of those calls every week. And they were talking about they had a couple of patients they treated with a tap originally. And I'm not trying to badmouth tap or Keith or anything like that. But because of the devices in the front, the hooks in the front, and, and I like that design from a, 
um, a symmetry standpoint, pulling from the front gives me symmetry pretty easily. You know, it's something we have to engineer into a device when we design them with Prosomnus. So I like that part, that component of it, but there's gonna have to be more acrylic in the front to hold on to all those parts and pieces. And once we bulk up the acrylic where the tongue's supposed to be, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, protruding that mandible a bit more so that the design of these older devices and everything is giving way. You're starting to see all kinds of cool things. You're starting to see more milled devices. You're starting to see innovation in materials and designs. And, and that's what we need. We need to move away from the kinds of things that physicians have trouble trusting And here's what happens. This is a real survey, hundreds of physicians surveyed and, and lots of great stuff came out of the survey. Uh, this is the FSI survey, great stuff. And one of the, one of the data points that came out, it said, what are your main concerns, physicians, sleep physicians, about prescribing oral appliance therapy? And their top four concerns were efficacy. Now we know what the data looks like on that. We're really good at mild, pretty good at moderate, and we suck at severe, you know? We do. And that's why there's this balance for where should we place oral appliance therapy and where should we place CPAP or, or PAP therapy and how do we work with those two things. Then they're worried about patient comfort and discomfort because that is a direct impactor of patient adherence most physicians, I mean, look at that percentage, 60% of physicians did not understand that if an oral device was made, and this was about two years ago, but an oral device was made, that um, it would be covered by medical insurance. And, and nobody thought, a lot of them didn't think it would be covered by Medicare for sure. And then they're worried about side effects because they understand that bites change, teeth move, and jaw joints hurt, not to mention soft tissue irritations and stuff. So if those are the things that physicians are concerned about, as well as our communication, as well as us having earned their trust, as well as us making sure we send them back for the follow-up HSAT, these are things we can impact. And one of the bigger, biggest impacts on that is using a device that has good efficacy, is less prone to have discomfort, smaller, right? So a smaller design, it's easier for the patient to wear. And then we can certainly solve the problems with insurance coverage. And then certainly the newer devices are designed to mitigate side effects. And I don't want to sit here and blow Prosomnus's horn all night long, but if you have a milled platform and it fits like a retainer, teeth won't move. And there's studies that have already proved that out for us. And if we're diligent about making sure that somebody uses a very specific kind of morning occlusal guide that helps position their mandible back, then we're going to lose less bites. And if we have bilateral symmetry, like we got with the hook or like we get with a precision engineered appliance, by gosh, we're going to have less temporomandibular discomfort. Also, along with not starting them in too protrusive a position. And all this matters. Could you go to the next slide? Because all this really matters because the, the critical thing is, it's not just what I think about this. Our, our physicians that we're working with, 91% of them are going to see your patient for a follow-up visit after you've made that oral appliance. So they're going to see if you made them a suck down 060 splint and put a strap on it. They're going to see if you made a thermocryl device and a year later, it's hard to tell what material it is. They're going to see if, and I can fill in the blank on a number of different designs and devices, and I'm trying to pick a couple that are harder to keep clean over a long period of time. They're going to see that. And if, and if that's how we're going to endear and earn the trust of physicians, it's just not going to happen. And so the idea is for us to really have custom mandibular repositioning devices, custom devices that help patients and help physicians have more trust and success in oral appliance therapy. If you could grab the next slide, that'd be great. I just got a couple more and then we can take some questions, which will be fun. So uh, I'm just going to throw in there, you know, put consultation. It's no obligation. Somebody from DS3 will reach out to you. You know, if you absolutely. type that in, it doesn't cost you anything. We just ask a few questions, see where your sleep practice is. And if there's anything we can do to help you, we let you know. Thank you. I, I try to work into the conversation with the physician at that meeting that, um, you know, we've got this category of, Medicare devices that have to have some sort of a metal connection. Now the Oventus O2 vents got PDAC approval. So that's a little variation on that, but that's quite the outlier and not a very popular device anyhow. But but the, the Medicare Herps type designs and TAP are the only ones with the medical connection. And then the rest of the design should be much more patient centric. And I really try to make, you know, when they see a couple of devices and they, and I bring in some other devices, some uh, legacy devices, they can see that those are bigger and bulkier. The newer ones are smaller. And, I, and I'm trying to show them, these are the kind that we're using today. We're trying to use smaller devices, more comfortable devices made out of better materials. Cause then they're going to be thinking, well, maybe some of those reasons that were on my list of, 
being hesitant about oral appliance therapy, they won't be so hesitant on. So that's important. And I talk about combination therapy. I talk about compliance. And even though we still don't see a lot of Theramon chips or Brabon chips and a lot of compliance sensors and devices, you know that's coming. You know that technology is coming. If they can put the kind of, uh, actually, I, I went to point to my Fitbit and I realized I've got a Shinola watch on. <laughs> so my bad. So, uh, pretend I've got my Fitbit on. If, I, if they can put those kind of sensors in there and the kind of things we see in like the Night Owl or the Watch Pad, well, you, you, we've got to be able to put some sort of a sensor in this. It's going to get really sophisticated in the next few years. That's exciting stuff. Next slide. We'll just go through these really quickly so we can get to the finish points. Devices come in different sizes. This is just a, a, a simple question about bulk and size. These are all devices made for the same mouth. And you've got a couple of milled variants in there. You've got artisanal variants that are made from Legacy. And the second one from the top, that blue one, looks like it could be kind of small, but you know, it barely covers the mesial of the first molars. And so that's kind of interesting because if the way you make a device small, and yet when you dunk these all in water and do an Archimedes test, and the studies have shown this out, still these new mill devices like we're using are so much smaller than the others. And especially if you go to that select design, even smaller than some of the other mill platforms. Next slide. The precision I mentioned, this is a study by University of Pacific that if you're using a milled precision platform, then you've got the opportunity there to not have teeth move. They took two years later, went back and took new scans and impressions and then overlaid them in an ortho analyzer software no statistically measurable tooth movement. That's a significant finding because we know that teeth move in devices, teeth move more in devices that have ball clasp for retention, then they move even more in devices that are flexible nylon printed materials. Now the, the ball clasp ones move more than something where there's acrylic holding the teeth everywhere because if there's ball clasp, I know that that's usually the only place where the retention is and the rest of it has a little bit of roominess to make it really easy to deliver. But when you do that, Easy to deliver like that means poor fit, means you're going to get movement of the teeth under force. That's just going to happen. Next slide. And My, just driving a wedge in between. Oh, those yeah. Teeth. Amen. Amen. The, the next it slide. It works is, great. It works great, Mark, <laughs> if you want to save some of that ham sandwich for later, because the first bite you take is going to go right in between those two teeth. Correct. The, the, the next slide is one of my favorite slides. This is from an article that uh, Michael Gelb wrote, and he lets me borrow this all the time. But and, and this is a very scientific study, that series of colored pictures on the side. And that's a, a very scientific material that was tested on all these uh, different uh, types of uh, surfaces. And it was mustard and mustard over 28 days. And look at the different uptake by soft liner material or, you know, regular, somewhat um, porous. Now, our, the milled PMMAs come from a control cured puck of polymethyl methacrylate, which is much denser, much easier to polish, very smooth. But look at it under the scanning electron microscope. It's still got some porosity. That's the one on the far left. It's still got porosity, but nothing like coal cured acrylic, nothing like soft liner, nothing like the nylons. And so that, those are the challenges we have. Um, I've, I've told this story a million times and, and the people in Prasomnus know that there's always an opportunity for me to use other devices. It's not always 100%. I can't 100% of the time use Prasomnus. And I've had a couple of patients who had, you know, veneers in the anterior and they were worried about hard acrylic on their teeth. So I told them there was an alternative and we'd go to this printed nylon, but I told them they risk more tooth movement and these risk gunking up. And so they've got to, there's always seems to be a trade-off, doesn't there? When you, you know, no device. Hey, everything no device, in life is a trade-off. Right on. Right now, we need we need some sort of an evolution to a new device to allow us to do that. The, the next slide is fun because it's a precision slide and it shows that if you take a bite and you send uh, that bite to three different manufacturers and you have, I'm sorry, to five different manufacturers and you have three different versions, three different cases sent, how accurately does the mounting of that case come back as exactly where you took the bite? And it turns out when you live in CAD CAM world with precision design and engineering, you can get really smoking crazy close. And that that's what we're able to do at Prosomnus. I love walking around on the floor when I'm out in California and I see that every single case is on an articulator. And I see the meticulousness, which with we try to reproduce the exact bite and we can't, but we can get within a millimeter and that's pretty darn good. But look at the different, you've got a nylon strap device, a, a couple of traditional dorsal devices, and you've got that fulcrum strap device with the, with the uh, band going across the front. That's how many millimeters in three-dimensional space the mountings were off from the bite that the doctor prescribed. And that's why we'll get cases back and sometimes they're too far forward, too far back, too far right, too far left. It's a, it's a matter of using the right kind of precision. So 
I've got uh, and that that plays into you know as well, Mark. When we're when we're dealing with side effects and you know we're doing all totally. of that stuff. So th yeah. this is where you could tie in the science to, hey, you know my patients had you know nothing but jaw trouble. You know with the the only three I I have that I know who have had a dental device made. This is where you can tie in that type of thing with how we're trying to change that and what we're doing differently. Yeah, absolutely correct. So when I am talking to physicians, I show them models of these kinds of devices and I show them some of the legacy devices and they can see that they're smaller. They seem to be made better. And so there's some advantages that starts to, to change their thinking. Some of the science I don't spend a lot of time on, next slide, is, is talking about things like um, the efficacy of CPAP versus the adherence of CPAP, the efficacy of oral appliances versus the adherence of oral appliances. If they want to walk down that road into that kind of a discussion, if they introduce and open that door and clearly are waving me in, I'll have that conversation, but it's not something I'm expecting to have. I want to be able to talk to them about the mean disease alleviation or the sleep adjusted residual AHI scores because, next slide, they, they're all aware of the McAvoy SAVE trial where patients treated and a pretty good number of patients half of them random controlled trial, half of them treated with CPAP, half of them not treated at all, and no difference in cardiovascular outcomes over, look at that, seven years. Now we know that this is kind of an unfair evaluation because there were clearly patients who wore their CPAP regularly, and I'm certain as I breathe air, had fewer cardiovascular incidents. But as a population of patients, give 1,200 people a CPAP, and then when you look at the adherence and then you look at how much they wear it per night and how many nights per week, it was not enough to create enough mean disease alleviation to alter the slope of that graph. So last slide on the Yeah, studies. and unfortunately, I wanna throw in on that mark too, you know, a lot of times the, the physician's answer is, well, you just need to try harder to use your CPAP, <laughs> you know, and, and that's a, that's, we could talk for an hour about that. But yeah. there, there's no question that there's, um, that is one, solution and and the, the challenge I think for PAP manufacturers is they've been trying to make smaller, quieter, more effective, better sealing masks and hoses and machines for a very long time. And when you look historically at the trends on most of the articles about adherence, they still have not been that, that good. So am I crapping on CPAP? God, no, we need that. There's nothing more powerful for me than to say to a patient, and I I, I love saying this. I hate to have to say it, but I love saying this. Well, you know what I'm going to talk to you about now because they're not getting the kind of result we want. We got an oral appliance patient and we started them at, you know, they didn't want to wear CPAP and the, the doctor said, go ahead, try oral appliance therapy first. They started at 67. I got them down to 32 and the patient says, I feel a lot better. And I go, yeah, but you're still severe. You're still going to die at an early age with this disease. So you know what I'm about to tell you. We've tried all kinds of different mandibular positions and you're sleeping differently on your side. We're trying all kinds of things and we can't get those numbers down enough to, to get you healthy. You know what I'm going to tell you? And they go, yeah, I got to try that CPAP, don't I? Well, now we've got a much more receptive. Yeah, we've got a much stronger referral for CPAP. Now we've got all kinds of articles. Uh, we've got a bibliography. I think it's about 80 articles now, long now at Prosomnus that we use for, for patients and, and, and I mean, for physicians and, and primary cares and PAs, but I wouldn't pull that out. I wouldn't lead with that. I would wait until the door opened and, and they invited you through to talk about the science behind that because nobody wants to have that shoved in their face. And, and, and we need to work together with them to find out and I love it, Dave Coons at Prasamus will talk about a couple of the studies he's done with some of his physicians and dentists working in combination, asking and answering the question, I, I have a patient in front of me, what is the best therapy for that patient? Not what therapy serves me, what therapy serves that patient? Maybe it's Inspire, maybe it's MMA, maybe it's U triple P, maybe it's positional therapy, maybe it's just weight loss, maybe it's O2 at night, maybe it's oral appliance therapy, maybe it's PAP therapy. Maybe it's some sort of combination. And so I think keeping our focus on how do we help the patient, I, I think that's what's critical. And if we can convey that kind of energy and that kind of enthusiasm to our sleep physicians, they can't help but want to work with us. Let's take some questions. Uh, yeah, and I think if you keep the patient's best interest at heart, which is exactly what you're saying, it's hard to get too far offline. Totally. You know, because when you look at the big studies, the CPAP adherence and that, you know, the, the people who 
have CPAP and they use it all night, every night, and they love it, they look at everybody else like, what's the matter with yep. you? Why can't you wear that? And you know, all the other people that, that tried and couldn't do it, they look at you like, how in the world can you do that? So, and, and that's just different. So, you know, when we, we consult with these patients, we talk about this, you know, this is something that we put in the, our PowerPoint slide as well. So, you know, in summary. I, I would want my physician to know that I'm going to treat each and every one of their patients like I would treat my wife or my mom or my sister or them. I would use the best devices. I wouldn't cut corners. I wouldn't compromise. Um, I would want to be in network with the to make it easy for their their patients because they all want to know that. I, I would take Medicare. They'd all want to know that in one shape or form. And I would certainly be able to do some sort of consultation. Those are the kind of like basic entry level stakes that you've got to have to get in the game. As long as your wife and your sister aren't the same person, we're probably good in that sense. Okay. So remember, it's a numbers game. We want to get in front of as many people as we possibly can. We've talked totally. about the latitude for, you know, addressing their concerns. Uh, Mark gave you some great tips there about the types of questions you can ask and that kind of thing. And, and we've gone through this and, you know, nothing works as good as uh, combination therapy, you know, so a lot of times they'll have refractory uh, patients that they just can't treat. So um, get in front of as many as you can be persistent. You know, sometimes it takes multiple visits over several months in between, you know, uh, create your brochures that are dedicated to the sleep part of your practice. You need to have these prescription and LOMN pads, you know, and make sure that they understand that you reciprocate this, you know, that it goes both ways. So, you know, we're, we, we did pretty good on time there, Mark. We're going to go through a couple of questions now, but I know a lot of you out there, what do we do now? You know, where do we go next? So tell us a little bit about this course you're going to be doing upcoming. Oh yeah, thank you. I've got a, it's a three night course. So we're doing it over three nights. So it's just a couple of hours a night. So it's, you know, you can eat it like candy, little bites at a time. And uh, we won't be able to recreate the hands-on portion. So I'll do some demonstrations and I'll do it on the camera right here in front of you, that kind of thing. But it's, um, it, it's really designed for somebody who's getting started in sleep. Uh, it could be a great refresher course for somebody who's had several different things in sleep and wants to kind of bring that all back together and get ready. Um, and I think it's going to be great. I think Lisa can put, I think she just uh, did put a uh, link up there for uh, the three days in November, the 10th, 11th, and 12th that it's up. Um, it's it's going to be really kind of fun. They've got a bunch of people already signed up for it, so I'm excited about having it. Yeah. And, uh, and I've done one of these before. And they're fun. Use the early bird code. You know, it's 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 cheap education. You know, <laughs> you're you, you got one of the best educators in the entire country there, Dr. Mark, uh, who's going to be talking to you. He keeps it fun and exciting. Uh, we also have the uh, code for, uh, I mean, the uh, course for billing uh, mm -hmm. that Lisa uh, does, and that is a wonderful thing as well. And that's that's during the day, you know, on 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern. And and there's a a code there, the DS3100 that you can use. Uh, to save a uh, uh, hundred bucks on that. And you know, Richard, if, if someone reaches out to their prosomnus rep, there's some really innovative things they'll do to help you with that tuition, you know, in terms of uh, helping you pay for the tuition for any of those courses. So prosomnus will help with that. Reach out to your rep and, uh, and they can do that. Do you Send guys have email. a way where, where you can give them some type of a scholarship or something? Yep, we do. We do. So reach out and we can talk about that individually. You can email info at Prosomnus or mmurphy at Prosomnus and I'll connect you with the right people. Happy to do that for sure. Yeah, I think we have that somewhere here. So uh, the can, I grab next... one of the, can I grab one of the questions to get started? Yeah, the next the next uh, oh, yeah, webinar the that we'll be doing yeah. November 17th, you know, we'll be talking about uh, the sleep test and all those numbers on there and all that other kind of stuff. So that's a good you, one. That's a really yeah. good one. Yeah, I, we look forward to doing that. And it's usually very well attended. The uh, the oh, I forgot what I was going to say, Mark, about that. So the. We, uh, you know, I, I love this picture. We're going to get to the questions in just a minute. You know, I don't remember. You were such a I cute little that. boy, Richard. You were so cute when you were little. But you just think, you know, that's the kind of, yeah, you know, you have to have, you know, to make this happen. And some of the questions actually uh, lend themselves to this. So I love that. Never give up. You know, that's that's it. Uh, type in PowerPoint. We'll get that to you. Uh, Mark, let's go through some of these questions now. Work in an area, only one sleep doc. Um, you know, we'd be, uh, um, and, and he's not getting a lot of, yeah. So yeah, not getting so, a lot of support. Sure. 
So um, you're certainly not doomed to fail. There's a lot of great telemedicine solutions. Uh, this is if you don't have a lot of sleep physicians around you, there are telemedicine solutions where they can get on a call with a physician, they can get sleep tested, um, they can get prescribed uh, CPAP or oral appliance therapy as appropriate. And then from there, you'd go ahead and treat them if they're an oral appliance patient and send them back for the follow-up sleep test, which should also be done from a telemedicine perspective. So some, today, especially, there's been an explosion of telemedicine uh, capabilities for those kinds of uh, opportunities. So I, and I think that's a, uh, that's a very viable opportunity. And, and Michael, you can email me privately if you want, and I can detail some of that for you as well. No question. For sure. Yeah. And Ian Barwick, too, you know, talked about how this sleep doc is, you know, if I work with you, I'm going to be affecting my livelihood. And I, I will tell you, Ian, man, I really have a hard time in general with people who have that mentality of paucity. You know, there's just not enough for us to go along, to go around out there. And, you know, when you think about what will you be doing that would affect his livelihood, you're not going to do the baseline sleep test. You're not going to um, uh, do the follow-up sleep test. You know, he, he very likely doesn't own the DME company anymore because of the Stark laws and Medicare. So he's not making money on, on DME. So, you know, I, you just somehow you got to get in front of the guy and just say, hey, how do we together, how do we help, you know, patients mm -hmm. more? And just, just let him see that, you, you know, CPAP is the answer for a lot of these people, but, you know, most of the people won't wear their CPAP. What are you doing for those people? You know, how is me, how, how is throwing me a bone uh, affecting your livelihood when you do that? And I don't know. No, for sure. How do you advertise um, without making people mad? <laughs> well, Mark well, already talked about don't use the, you know, uh, the hate CPAP kind of stuff because that is a absolute turnoff. Well, it's, it's a lot a, of these sleep talks. It's an approach that doesn't fit my style, but I could see where an individual could decide they're going to they're going to pit CPAP against oral appliance therapy. Patients would love that. I, I do want patients to have a choice, so I put both. Um, so we've got a really nice poster of Prosomnus that says you can live with OSA, and then it shows all the different therapies. And so it's a it's a very comprehensive kind of poster that Heather put together that. It includes CPAP as one of the treatment options. I, on every single patient consultation, when I'm going through my, I've got this deck of eight slides I review with almost every patient. Um, one of the treatments that I talk to them about is CPAP. And I don't talk about it as it's bad. It, people will say, oh, I could never wear that. I've got a friend that wore that. They hate that. I could never do that. I tried that, you know, whatever it is. And I'm like, I get that. I go, but sometimes that's the only thing. And and it's a wonderful tool to have because if a patient says, well, I've got this, it feels a little tight here or something like that. So if that's not working out for you with the sore appliance, we can always go back to CPAC. Oh, no, no, no. I'll get used to this. <laughs> so you can always, you can always hold that out as a hammer, but no, I think you, you want to be judicious and, and, uh, and respectful as terms of how you advertise. How would you like a local sleep physician advertising against oral appliance therapy? So I think you got to walk that road very, very carefully, very delicately for sure. Yeah, and we're certainly, you know, how do we document the efficacy we're doing? Uh, you know, we're using pulse oximetry at multiple positions in my office. Mm -hmm. And then once we get to the best position, we're not guessing anymore at this stuff. Then we send them back for the follow-up sleep test. Yeah. Uh, Dr. I like, Serkin, I didn't know I like he what, was I like on. What you, I like what you said, Richard. And then we send it back for the follow-up sleep test. I make a huge point with the patient that this is the pretest that tells me you have this disease. It's your blood test that tells me your cholesterol is high. We're going to put you on a medication. We're going to put you on an oral appliance. We're going to follow that titrate and get it just right, the dosage. And then I've got a quick little test that is not a sleep test. My, my fingertip thing that you wear, my pulse oximeter is not a sleep test, but it's one piece of information from a sleep test. And it will help. I always tell the patient, you will give me subjective information as to how you're sleeping, how you're feeling, how you're snoring. And then I will get some objective information about your oxygen levels. And if those are all good, then you'll be ready to go back for your follow-up sleep test. That's the only way we know that you're really in therapy. So I really pound that. And with that, we still don't get everybody going back for the follow-up sleep tests. I wish I could tell you I was perfect, but I'm not. Well, I think a lot of times that people, hey, I feel great. My wife says I'm not snoring. I don't really care what the numbers say. And that kind of leads into Dr. Serkin question. You know, one of the Love significant concerns is, you know, these MDs are, you know, hey, we you get them from 50 down to 
10, but that's still really mild sleep apnea. You know, can you get them below five? And I know when, when I'm approached with that, I simply say, you know, we always discuss combination therapy for anybody who has AHIs of 20, 25 or higher. You know, we, we have, you, just like you said earlier, Mark, when you, mm-hmm. you open the door for CPAP, even on somebody who uses a dental device first, because we can't treat everybody successfully. CPAP can't either. Uh, then we, we do that. I mean, you've had patients, you know, they come sure. in, you say you're wearing your device. No. What, what, you know, is I, it hurting? No, you know, nothing. Why are you wearing it? I don't know. Yeah. You know, I mentioned this registry and this registry is, um, it's always the last bunch of cases that, that I've done for that period of time. And we've got, uh, we've got pre, post, age, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and, um, and, and then over on the side, I do a data breakdown where, and, and this is to your question, Dr. Sirkin, is the, as I say, what percentage of this, of the milds and what percentage of the moderates and what percentage of the severes did I get below five? And, and guess what? It's not hundred percent. And then what percentage did I get below 10? And then what percentage did I decrease their AHI score by 50%? I have all three of those data points for each of those sections because I have found that, as you're pointing out here, different um, sleep physicians may have different metrics that they want to think about when we say success. How do we know that we're in as successful a treatment as we can get? And it's going to be always be a little bit subjective in that it's hard for it just to be a number because if a patient absolutely refuses all of the therapies, then the best we may be able to treat that patient, at least at this time, might be a 50% or below 10. Now, if we started at 70 and we got them below 10, that's probably a huge win. If we, if we started at 70 and got down to 35, we're still losing. And, and my success for, for getting people that are mild below 10 is 100% because I'm only worried about the 14s, 13s, 12s, and 11s. So that's not a very impressive statistic. So I think in each group, milds, I, I almost feel like it's a failure if I don't get them below five. Moderates is kind of a mixed bag. I want the physician to be comfortable. So my different sleep docs will have different measurements of success, as well as including their quality of life metrics. And and maybe they were, uh, I've had a couple, I've had a couple of these where they're uh, drug resistant hypertensives, and they were able to now get very responsive to to their drugs because we got their apnea under control, at least better, even though they weren't completely healed. So it's those different kind of metrics for different sleep physicians and in different categories of, of, uh, of disease. I think that's a really important uh, way of looking at the metrics. So a great yeah. question. And we always throw in, you know, the, the patient's willingness to use or not use CPAP. Like you said, sure. if they're, Hey, look, I can't talk the guy into CPAP. If you can, good luck. You know, I'd love to do sure. combination therapy. We can make custom masks. We can do that. Yeah. Uh, uh, allergies, I, I, I know we don't see that a whole lot. I don't know specifically what they are for the prosomnus devices. I'll let Mark talk about that. Yeah, we do sure. see them for some nickel and some other things. What we have done in my office is we contact the device manufacturers. They'll send us little buttons that we can then tape under the patient's arm, or we can do something like that to see if it is an allergic device. Rarely has it ever been the device that was causing the problem. I will tell you that. Uh, up front in 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 my office, what kind of science can you tell us? Yeah, so the the good news is with a with a with a milled polymethyl methacrylate platform with no metal on it, I can eliminate all the metal allergies with mm-hmm. an IA device or an IA select. So I love that. However, I had one patient at, who came in and she said she's I'm nickel sensitive, for example, I'm nickel, nickel allergy, so I have these uh, titanium knees. I have two artificial knees, and so I had this one patient come in and. Uh, sleep apneic and, and treated and all set to go. And she tells me she's allergic to acrylics. And now I'm, now I've got this dilemma because she's my, she was the first patient I'd ever seen that was allergic to acrylics. And I wanted to put an IA platform in her mouth, IA select, cause she's petite. And even though I know that poly, our polymethyl methacrylate leaches so much less monomer, and that's usually what the reaction is going to be to, I would be extremely hesitant. Now it turned out she never came back. So I would have moved her to maybe a nylon device. So mm-hmm. I would have moved to another material. And then I would have said, and I might have said to her, so let's, uh, I can get samples of nylon, I can get samples of the acrylic, and I can have your physician test you just like you were suggesting with the different buttons and stuff. And that'd be a good way to eliminate. So I have not yet had a patient that was allergic to any of the materials we've had in their mouth that I'm aware of. I'll add that. Yeah, we we have had a few, but it it hasn't been very many. 
Now, let me tell you guys, at this point, you, you're all getting your CE. Some of you go, want to go watch the World Series. Uh, please give me an update on what the score is, you know, if you do that. Uh, but make sure you check your spam folders as well. You will get that within the next 48 hours. I'll get that PowerPoint together. Uh, it'll be a couple of days, too, before you guys get that. Somebody will reach out to email that to you. Uh, but uh, very good questions. We're going to stay on here and answer these questions. So, uh, but you guys... You know, if you don't want to hear this particular part, you don't have to. So uh, you will get your CE at this point. So is there a preferred scanner? Uh, I use the CareStream 3600. Uh, I absolutely love that thing. Mm -hmm. I have used others in the past. That's the one that I use. You have any comment on that? Yeah, so I have a Meded scanner and and I would be very happy with a CareStream. I, I would probably would go out and try to buy the 3700 tomorrow if I was going to do that. That's the new one they just came out with. Um, but we at Presomnus, we've got, uh, you know, I, I hate to even say this online, but we probably have nearly 50% of our cases come in digitally. Uh, we've got a lot of very advanced doctors that are uh, doing digital uh, submissions and so that, that makes the workflow easier. Digital bites and digital impressions. You don't want to take a digital impression in a uh, analog bite because that actually slows the case down um, and digital bites are so darn easy to take. But anyhow, um, we are very comfortable with all of the major manufacturers. So if somebody had a uh, trio, so they had a three shape, um, uh, uh, Itero, if they had a uh, Medit, if they had a care stream, probably not a 3,500, but a 3,600 or 3,700, we'd be very comfortable with that. Um, uh, the 3M True Def, we get good files with that. And certainly with the Omnicam and the Prime Scam, we've had good results. And so we've got all of the software to be able to deal with any of those cases. Um, I, I don't think we would sit down and say that we've got one scanner we think is preferred from the standpoint of the data sets we get in on the SDL files. I don't, I don't think operations would, would tell me that. I think it's more of like, which one works best in your hands? How much do they cost? What are the monthly dongle fees? You know, what are the monthly maintenance fees? That's probably from a preferred scanner standpoint. And, and I think the two we mentioned tonight are, you know, probably have some advantages from a cost perspective. There's no question about that. And, uh, but, but all those devices are really good. Uh, the, the three shape scanner is, you know, just a remarkable device. It's a little bit pricier, but you know, this is the end of the year and there are all kinds of tax advantages to buying something like that. So it's a good time to be making that decision. What I tell my wife when I buy a bunch of fishing tackle, I say, but look how much money I saved, honey. Mm -hmm. All and right. Now that you mentioned it online, it. you can write it off. We talk about uh, being profitable. You know, E0486 is the only code that I bill in my office. That's it. I don't know about you, Mark. You want to I add anything same. to that? I bundle. Yeah. I, do, I do the same bundle fee. Yeah. And when we talk about, you know, being and in And I network, use the same billing company that you do, I think. <laughs> Your billing That's company. Good. There you go. Uh, Dr. Paz says, how do you get past the gatekeeper? So that that's always one of the hardest things you can do. I think one tip uh, that you got there, Dr. Paz from Mark was saying, hey, how can we reciprocate that? Can, you know, if I want to make a referral to you, how do we do that? I, I think that lowers people's guard quite a bit. Uh, the second thing I would say to that is simply persistence. Mm hmm. You know, most dentists simply go out there and they, hey, can we meet? No. Okay. They turn around and walk away. You know, I, I'm going to ask that question. You know, people, I get asked all the time, how did you get so successful in doing this? And it's, you know, you get up <laughs> early and you work hard all day and you go, you know what I mean? You do that for years and years. It's, it's not rocket science, so to speak. Yeah. Anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, I would just say that uh, we, we were online with Lisa and Mike are online here and Mike and I were joking before we got started and we were just getting online and, and I said something he said yeah when you said that you sound like a salesman. And you said we're all salesmen and dentists we all have to be salesmen and we were laughing about it and it's it's so true, but I'm going to tell you, I would be a consultative salesman I am not hardwired to get told no and come back again and get told no and come back and get told no. But I'm going to tell you a really good salesperson somebody who's trying to get past the gatekeeper hears no not now. Right. No, not now, but maybe later. No, maybe one of these days. They keep thinking they're getting closer when they <laughs> are, when, when the other person's saying no, 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 and they keep thinking, but but they said no a little nicer this time, you know. So the average you just sales, mean no today. That's but right. What about yeah. tomorrow? The average salesperson is used to getting getting told no seven times without becoming discouraged. Seven. I get discouraged at one. Yeah. And I've learned to go two or three. And I would be honest, <laughs> I start with patient. I've got patience with mutual 
we got a mutual sleep doc between us, even though we've never known each other. That's a great door to knock on. And I go into my re registry and I ask to send them patients. Then I go back and I send them some patients. So I don't want to work with 20 sleep docs in the Rochester Hills area um, because I don't think that I could send them enough patients <laughs> to make that work. But I can, I can work with two or three intimately and a couple or three or four more peripherally. That's about it. All right, in network with companies, how do we make a profit when we have a lab bill of five or $600? Um, I would tell you, Mark, you know, most of us are getting in the neighborhood of $2,500 or so yep. to do this. If you are efficient at what you do, well said. and how, how you do it, and you have systems in place where you walk patients through, you are efficient at delegating what you can in a practice, you know, I have three other doctors who work with me. I have four assistants. And most of those assistants are better than most of the dentists in the United States, I'm sure, because we, we all of us doctors take time to train those assistants and do it. So, yep. you know, the lab guy, they, they have the lowest margins and they always feel like they're the guy getting squeezed the most, you know, when it comes to this. So just be efficient at what you do. You've got to work the numbers and make sure that that works. If you're in network, with a particular United Healthcare, for example, I'm just using that as an example, and you get paid $1,200 to do it, you might not want to make a five or six hundred dollar device for that patient. I would, but then again, you might want to because <laughs> you're going to have fewer problems. You're going to do that. I mean, we all have made that mistake before, where you know, oh, I, I had, I, you know, you walk up to the house and it's tilting like this, and you go, yeah, I went with the low bid on the brick guy, you know. And it's, let me let me take yeah. a let me take a stab at that in an interesting way. So the the two data points I would tell you is the average ADA practice bills out about three hundred fifty three hundred seventy five dollars per hour. That's ADA statistics, uh, H, uh, HP, the Health uh, Institute. Um, Statistics Institute. That's not my number. And then their hygiene department adds on to that. And and so and if somebody's doing a crown, that's probably their most lucrative activity they've got. They mix it in with some fillings and other things they do. So they're billing out even say four hundred dollars an hour. It doesn't matter. But in sleep, if you spent if if you wanted to be very hands on yourself and not be efficient and not use auxiliaries, which you can use tremendous auxiliaries, then um, you're going to have a more you chair time cost. But, but so let's say in the worst case scenario, I do everything and I invest a couple of hours in oral appliance therapy and it's 2,500 bucks and I got a $500 lab bill. I've still got a couple grand to split between those two hours, which is uh, last time I checked about three times more productive per hour. And now I'm talking net productivity after I've paid that lab bill than anything else I'm doing in dentistry. So um, maybe we can't make as much money if we're in network, um, if there's a high lab cost. The second thing about the high lab cost is if I make a device that's a little bit inferior and I have more device delivery time adjustments and more device intervention follow-ups, adjustments, breakage, gunky, delamination, all the kind of things that come along, then that's more chair time. And even if I'm taking away from my dental chair time at $400 an hour, if I spend 15, 20, or 30 minutes in additional chair time with a patient and I think, hey, I saved 75 bucks on this device because I chose a cheaper device, but I spent 30 minutes in chair time, that cost me 200, I'm out $125. And so we don't often think about the chair time. And you might say, well, I've got time, I can spend that, great. I'd rather go spend it with my family, go to a kid's soccer game, play golf on a Thursday afternoon, or go back into the other operatory and do a crown prep when I'm not adjusting one of those devices. So I think there's, there's a lot of different ways of looking at cost. And I, I don't think there's anything in anybody's average practice that they're being more productive per hour uh, than doing dental sleep medicine. So I think that's, that's just really looking at the math very, very accurately. Um, Especially when you can delegate a lot of this stuff. Totally. You know, I mean, it, it really, it really does make a difference, you know, when you, when you add in some of that stuff. Uh, okay. There's a goal. Dr. Sirkin has another great question of an AHI under 10. Why not under five? This is what perfect perplexes sleep physicians. Um, all I can tell you, Lee, is I didn't make that rule. You know, I, I don't know, Mark, where you came from or, you, you well, know, I've always I, heard I I, the goals, goal in my mind is always, I want to get the patient under five. We're just not always yeah. going to achieve that. And so that's why I said my statistics that I show all my sleep physicians 
and, and other dentists and that I work with is here's the percentage I'm getting under five. Here's the percentage I'm getting under 10. Here's the percentage I'm getting to 50% reduction in their HI score. And, and then if the, if the physician were to say to me, well, I'm only going to look at success when it's under five. Okay. Now we know something about our working relationship and that's all right. And, but most of the physicians I've worked with are okay with under 10. If they started with a bigger number, they're not okay with under 10. If we started at 14, yeah. And so that's why I've got all three of those data points so that the physician and I can talk through how do we determine when we're successful? What, what, what's our end point for treatment and therapy? Or, or do we kick everybody back who's over five um, back into a CPAP? And if that's the decision that I make with my physician, then that's what we would do. But that's going to yeah. be a protocol we're going to set up in terms of, you know, what are we going to consider successful management of this patient? Yeah, I think that's you fair. hit on something that's really important and i know we still got quite a few people on so thank you all for hanging yeah, out for and sure. doing this because we're we've had a lot of really good questions here but something you said earlier mark that i want to drive home again is that as the dentist we are not responsible for managing this disease correct the patient's physician is so yeah, we can say, I think we should be, I think we might do it better. I, I think I probably do a better job of managing sleep apnea than most primary mm -hmm. care physicians out there, but I don't particularly want that burden on me, to be honest with you. So we, mm -hmm. we, can, we can talk about the politics and who does what and how we do all of this. And that's going to play out over the next 10 to 20 years. And it will look different, I promise you, 10 years than it, than it does today. But right now, the burden of that, of that care is still on that physician. So I think we owe that physician some respect. And I think we should have a conversation where, you know, look, we're going to do the absolute best we can. We want that number as low as we can get it. And, and as long as the patient's willing to try, I'm willing to try. I, I do discuss combination therapy with all these people. I discuss CPAP. So, you, you know, this goes back to one of those earlier questions about, you know, you're going to be affecting my livelihood. And I have a hard time dealing with, with docs like that, but uh I just don't believe that's so. You know, I believe that if we keep the patient's best interest at heart, this guy has what he has yet to learn. I don't remember who asked that question, though, is that when when he engages you in in helping him manage these patients, mm -hmm. he's actually going to see more people. You know, that's what Great. these people don't understand. You know, you think all the way back to the first cell phones, Mark, remember the big old things that you could mm -hmm. knock somebody out with them, the bricks. You remember when they opened up the weekends for free minutes? <laughs> that was the best thing they ever did because what happened now is we all want to use our cell phones all the time. So, you know, it's hard for people to believe that when, you know, especially if you're young, that, you know, used to cost you 28 cents a minute to talk on your cell phone, you know, when they first came out. We don't get that. Okay, fee for annual follow ups. Uh, we charge 75 bucks in my office. Ian, Mark, you got a fee you want to throw out? Similar. Okay. Stan, do you have any experience with airway metrics? Uh, I do have some, Stan. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's it's the combination of different bite techniques where you put it in there and you do it. I don't know how much science is behind that, but I do like the idea of I have a, a way of control of, of adding or subtracting more vertical and protrusion. Correct. And that's all we're trying to do to get to a starting position mm -hmm. that we think is, is the best. So yeah. there are other gauges, the pro gauge and the George gauge and the SOM gauge. And, you know, there's a n number of these things out there. Uh, I think you could take a really good bite with nothing but popsicle sticks, you know, if Absolutely. you want to and you wanted to take the time to do it what I, what I would say about airway metrics is and, and I have the kit and I use it but um, I, I, I would say this I'm trying to find the best mandibular position for the mandible the best position for the mandible that will open the airway that the patient's comfortable with and, and I'm probably not going to find that on the first visit because we we probably can't get them in that position and get them comfortable enough there we might be stretching their ligaments and their muscles a little bit so we've got to balance comfort and where we want the mandible most of the movement to open the airway is going to be from a horizontal movement, but vertical plays a role as well. And we know that we know that there are patients for whom 
the muscles, the how they bond, the position, how they advance, the angle of the eminentia, all of that means that they need a little bit more vertical. And I need three millimeters of vertical to make an appliance with Prosomnus, a little bit more with some others. So I'm going to use a George gauge most of the time to start with. And I'm going to play with snore sounds and things like that to try and find the right position. And if I'm not getting good resolution that when I'm trying to take the bite for a starting position, I'll add vertical. And when I add vertical, airway metrics comes right into play. Now I have plenty of friends, and so does Richard, who start with airway metrics and start with more vertical and then start to play with the with the protrusion. So which one is right? Yes, of course we are. Doesn't matter. It's it's about we're both all trying to find the right three-dimensional position for the mandible that opens the airway best. And Richard and I probably both start with, and I agree with your popsicle stick example, I'm going to probably move horizontally first. And then if that isn't working, I'm going to add vertical. I've gotten patients where I've titrated the crap out of them, done everything we can, and I can't get resolution at three millimeters opening. And we come back and now add vertical. And I put some acrylic on the devices and cold cured on there to test out the position. And holy crap, they stop snoring and their HI score drops down. But I, I start horizontal and go vertical and it sounds like you do the same thing, Richard. We do, very good. Okay, uh, what point do you decide to go sleep only in your practice? Uh, how many delivered appliances per month to start? So uh, to uh, Dr. Anonymous attendee, I will say my <laughs> first- every class you've ever had, by the way. Every I, class I, you've I, ever had. I think I did one dental device the first month I decided I was going to do this. You know, I remember coming home and telling my wife, I'm going to, I'm going to sell my practice and open a practice and only do sleep medicine. And this is 19 years ago now. And, you know, I married my high school sweetheart too, Mark, Good 38 man. years Good ago. Man. And uh, she just looked at me and said, are we going to have to move? I really like our house, <laughs> you know, because I guess that was uh, a slight nod of confidence, you know, when you say that, but uh you know, at some point, I, I think it's a little bit like the uh, field of dreams thing. You know, if you build it, they will come. <laughs> I, I, I truly believe that. I mean, when you think about if you you got out there and you started visiting these physicians, even if you were doing one a week or two a week, you know, if you don't, if you sell your practice and you're all you're going to do is sleep, you don't have anything else to do, uh, you know, until you start getting patients. So you go talk to the dentist, you know, you, you're not a threat to the dentist anymore because you don't have a high speed handpiece in your practice. You don't do any dentistry at all. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, get out there and just start working it and hustling it. And, and I think, you know, if you, there are some people who can help you do that. That's what we do at Dental Sleep Solutions. You know, Prosomnus has some, some things that they can help you with as well. You know, when you do this, you don't have to reinvent the wheel anymore when you, when you do this. So I, I would, whoever asked that, I would love to sit down and talk for 10 or 15 minutes, you know, about that. But I, I will tell you that there is certainly enough uh, patience out there for most of us to make a living at this. I agree. For, for me, I can't really answer that question because I, I uh, came back to dental sleep medicine the last several years in a, only in a part-time capacity. And one of the things that helped make it work for me was I rent space from somebody else. So I don't have to have my own brick and mortar. What I have found though, is there's a number of dentists out there who are looking at their practices, looking at transitioning. And so the beautiful thing is if you've got a good thriving dental practice and you start to bring in your own sleep patients and you spend a year or two working through them and developing relationships with other physicians and other dentists who might refer to you, then you've got a smoother transition. Not sure about the exact numbers of how many you need. It depends on your finances, your financial situation, but I think there's a good transition that can be made there and, and a good opportunity. So Richard, I think we have cleared the board. We have. Awesome. As always, Mark, I've enjoyed uh, spending part of the evening with you. Thank you so much for your insight. If I and, could just uh, make one correction, I got a neat little text from a friend that said, technically at Prosomnus, we are 65% digital. I said we're nearly 50%. We're 65% digital. So there you go. There I feel better go. about correcting that. Oof, well, well we're, we're, we're moving towards that. And, and if, if you're a dentist and you get the opportunity to go out and, and visit their lab in California, I would highly encourage you to do that because you're, you're you know, Dr. Paz is, is a young dentist who's an up and coming star in this and he's working with me right now. And you said he just came out to do that. And I said, man, he has, you, you guys have just won him over. You know, he's a very bright guy and he's, he's got, uh, you, you know, uh, this science type of background. Well, he, won, and, he won us over, I'll tell you that for sure. That's what I heard. Yeah. 
Oh, he's a good guy. So, yeah. well, awesome. Thank you again, uh, everybody. You will be getting the uh, uh, PowerPoint a couple of days. You'll be getting your CE as well. Any parting comments? Yeah, I would just say that a couple of people have asked uh, questions to follow up with me. Email me at mmurphy. That's pretty easy. mmurphy at personas.com. So feel free to email me at mmurphy at personas.com and I'll explain how to become a personas dentist and send you anything else that I talked about. Thanks so much. Awesome. And there's at the bottom of the screen, there's some email for both of the uh, companies that we work with that uh, we'll, we'll be glad to help you any way we can. So thanks again, Mark. Everybody have a good evening. Peace, Richard.